still have some stragglers joining, so I'll just accept them as they come in. I think mm -hmm. we're good to get started if you are. Okay, so, sure. So we have Nicole from IBM, and she's going to talk to us about how to enable your mainframe to take part in your end-to-end -end application observability journey. Um, so this session is 5 a.m., which is quite ironic because that's not far off the time it is for Nicole right now. So please do make sure you do feedback at the end of the session and that kind of thing if you do end up having to leave early. And I can't mind you by the end. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to Nicole. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for the intro. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, like she said, my name is Nicole Nemec. I'm an IBMer. I'm an offering manager over there based stateside um, in our RTP lab, well, based from my home right now, but in RTP. Um, and yeah, so we're gonna spend some time today talking about observability and of course, how you ensure Z is a part of that. And I know um, the whole concept of observability is probably new to some of the folks um, that may be on this session today or maybe watching after the fact. So I'll really start um, kind of from square one, talking about what observability truly is, and then we'll go into, of course, the Z piece of that as we as we go forward. Um, so if you are a pro at observability, and this is something that you've already made a strategic priority in your organization, I hope you don't find this too uh, beginner level or 101, but um, want to make sure that we're all on the same page as we progress this discussion. So I gave Sophie the heads up that if you have questions throughout the session, um, feel free to put them in the chat and she will interrupt me and um, give them and I'll answer them right on the spot. Um, but yeah, I would heavily encourage any questions throughout, just, just pop them in there and we'll make this as much of a discussion as it can be over, <laughs> over Zoom. Zoom. Um, so as we get started, I always like to start really high level with an example. Um, I think it sets the stage uh, pretty easy when we try and start taking a technical concept and applying it to real life. And so I always use something that is pretty common in my day-to-day -day life, which is mobile payment, sending cash back and forth through our phones, whether that's through Cash App or Zelle or PayPal or Venmo, there's a ton of different platforms that do this now. Um, and whether someone's picked up the check at dinner and you want to cover your portion or you're sending cash over to your roommate for picking up groceries that week, um, there are so many ways and use cases that we're relying on these very simple, like the UI and the whole experience is overall quite simplistic. We rely on these more than a few times a day. And I think it gets lost on a lot of us how complex the back end or you know, what's behind the curtain is of all of the different processes that are going on to make this experience so seamless and smooth, whether it's bouncing from the cloud to different middlewares or storage systems across different networks worldwide. And of course, in many cases, you've got that back end of IBM Z or the mainframe. Um, it just kind of goes to show you that all of these pieces have to be working together flawlessly uh, for us to get that experience that we um, come to rely on every day. So as we talk about observability and we talk about the challenges that all of our businesses are facing to kind of that have really kicked off the need for this whole movement, just think about very simply one of those mobile services or digital services that you rely on day in and day out and all of the complexities that are probably, you know, being scrutinized and stressed over somewhere across the world um, day in and day out because they know they want to keep their business. So these are kind of the thinking about it from a business perspective or a market perspective. Um, that's kind of part of my responsibility, but it also, I think, helps, again, set the stage for folks, regardless of whether you're strictly a tech person, a business person, or manager, what have you. There are four, in my mind, really key points um, that have driven the need for observability, this principle, um, in our businesses. And I'll go into each of them in a bit more detail, but the first one, of course, being your digital experience as a company is going to make or break customer loyalty. But of course, kind of like we just mentioned, 
there is such a complexity now of trying to manage all of those pieces across your enterprise, across different geos, time zones, um, different skill levels to ensure that that digital experience is what customers love and there's no hiccups or interruptions to that. And of course, um, naturally, a lot of the monitoring has moved away from being infrastructure focused to very application first, um, because we know that at the end of the day, your business is really live or die by your customers. So your monitoring needs to be first and foremost concerned with how are your customers interacting with your product? Are they having any problems or is everything running smoothly? And then um, many times I, when I'm in my capacity for my personal role, I'm not meeting with Z folks. I'm meeting with SREs, um, site reliability engineers, application owners, line of business folks. And I have to remind them, of course, that IBM Z plays a really critical role in all of these business critical applications that our consumers are relying on. And so any strategy for this application focused monitoring has to ensure that Z is first and foremost a part of that as well. So going into the first point, this is probably not rocket science. Um, as consumers ourselves, it's pretty easy to kind of put ourselves in these shoes anytime we've had an outage. I, um, I have actually had been out of internet here in the States since Friday. I just got it back last night and I was using the ISP's mobile app over the past couple of days to try and get updates on my trouble ticket. And oh my goodness, it made me want nothing more than to get a different internet provider um, because the digital experience of how they manage their like customer support services, slowness of their app, all of these things um, really do impact you know, our buying decisions in general, but of course loyalty, which long-term is really important for customer, uh, for enterprises because you're trying to understand, of course, who's sticking around, who's going to be a reliable source of revenue for you. And customers just don't have tolerance for it anymore. Um, if you know, we know that a customer has a rep or a provider has a reputation for bad service, we're not going to use them. Um, and of course, we're getting even more particular about services. I think in the past, if something was running slowly or um, you know, maybe there was an outage in a service, we would maybe just be a little bit more patient with them, give them a little bit more grace. But now, um, as we all become so online, especially during this era of being at home and online all the time, um, we won't tolerate it. If something's down, we're canceling our account and moving on to the next vendor. Um, and that's something that I think it's, everybody kind of knows implicitly, but it has to be said out loud is part of the reason that the next point, the complexity and the pressure that a lot of uh, teams feel internally is because the business recognizes that there are a lot of competitors. Um, digital businesses have made it super easy for anyone to enter the market and start competing against the legacy customers. Um, and of course, if there's more competition in the market, it drives power to the consumers and it makes it good for us as individuals, um, but definitely competition gets increased. And uh, when something goes wrong, it's a lot easier to just jump to a competing service and not have a second thought about it. Um, and I think this, again, another very obvious point here, which is the most common feeling that we get frustrated with in our digital services is just slow performance. Um, it's not, you know, the complexities of the UI or perhaps response time from customer service. It's truly, is this running slow or fast? That's the number one thing people get frustrated with. And of course, we all talk. Uh, I've already told you about the ISP that has wronged me so recently. Um, but yeah, everybody, not everybody, but the majority of folks when they have a bad digital experience, they're going to share it with the people close to them or the people not close to them, like listening to a webinar um, that don't even live in America that can't even get service from frontier communication. So all of these things I'm sure we've all experienced here, um, but it really just is worth emphasizing because it really does drive from the next point, which is there is incredible pressure um, from inside your companies now to be able to meet these customer expectations and manage your applications. Um, so of course, complexity is growing. 
I love open source technology. I first and foremost am a student of technology and I love all of the new and exciting um, ideas that we can bring into our products even more quickly um, because we at IBM are you know, big proponents of open source, but also um, as we enter this whole world of like cloud and Kubernetes, it, it, at least for my product team internally has enabled them to adopt so many new exciting technology frameworks. But let me tell you, it is complicated to manage all of that um, because you've got to bring it on board to your entire team. You've got a whole new set of requirements you need to take into account. Um, so there is definitely a challenge um, to the upside of you know, all of this is exciting technology that is scaling up in so many of our businesses. And I think this is, if you've been on the side of, you know, the monitoring of an application, a business critical application, you know that all of this exciting new technology that our developers are keen to adopt, it scaled out quite quickly. And of course, um, it makes it really hard if you're someone responsible for monitoring that application to follow all of the different moving pieces um, that are now like we showed on that first slide, responsible for working better together uh, for customers to have a good digital experience. If it's something simple like web app requesting into a database, not such a big deal, but when you've got 10 different technologies that are all required for this experience to work flawlessly, it's really doubles down the pressure on the people maintaining the applications. Um, and that in, creates this whole interesting conversation around um, AI ops, which I'm sure many of you guys have heard about, which basically boils down to there is so much going on in monitoring these applications that no human team can even do it themselves. When you're some of the largest corporations in the world that I work with regularly, you've got thousands, tens of thousands of transactions going every second, um, and in many cases through different paths of your application. So, of course, it's it's you could have all the guys on your team in the world, but you wouldn't have the manpower truly to be able to monitor, identify trends, identify outliers. So that's where machine learning, artificial intelligence, all those buzzwords you've heard really are applicable here um, because somebody has to make sense of that data in a way that's efficient and can surface the most important insights to um, the people who have very busy and high stress jobs. So, and the next point, like we've kind of already started to build up to is that we're no longer focused inside of our organizations on these infrastructure specific tools that wouldn't you know allow us to deliver the monitoring experience that our customers really care about if when frontier my isp says oh our service is down I don't care if it's because of technology A or technology B, I just wanna know when it will be restored. Um, and so that's why it's so important to have application-centric or application-first monitoring tools because your customers, the ones that are making money that um, you're worried about losing to your competitors, they are the ones interfacing with the application first, not the individual technology pieces. Um, so APM solutions are what we're probably going to talk about more in general but I, I try not to be too specific about what I mean by application um, monitoring tools, which you'll, you'll see in a second. But um, a lot of these tools are really lightweight. Um, they allow very quick instrumentation and to get up and running um, within a matter of minutes to be able to map that customer journey. You can get a lot of really interesting insights from a business perspective to see you know, customer funnels and how many people are you retaining throughout the journey. So really these application tools um, and APMs more specifically have done a great job of being able to gather all of that feedback, um, applying in many cases an AI or an ML engine to the, like the massive seas of data that they're collecting and generating insights that are really good. Um, whether you're a developer, you can get views that are specific to the things that you're focused on as you're using these tools before you've been able to push code to production. Whether you're an SRE or you're an application owner and you're truly, like we've talked about, focused on performance of the overall application that's in production, or even if you're a business professional. Um, I talk with a lot of leaders who 
aren't the most technical. They're not in there on the day-to-day -day managing the exact performance of an application, but they need to know, like, is it red, yellow, or green? And these application monitoring tools um, are really the easiest way to get that type of view, whether it's something as simple as red, yellow, green, all the way down to code level, complexity, and detail. Um, these application tools are gonna provide that. And of course, like I said, um, I spend a lot of time talking to folks that aren't very Z focused, but I know this is a conference where Z is first and foremost, um, one of the main focuses. And we know that the adoption of Z is continuing to grow. Workloads on the platform are growing. Um, and I think the one that resonates the most when I'm talking to folks who aren't super familiar with their organization's Z strategy is that 72%, I think, Forrester estimates of customer facing applications are very dependent on mainframe processing. So when you're thinking about developing an observability strategy or an application, business critical application monitoring strategy, if you're missing the Z piece of it, you're missing a really significant portion um, of the heavy lifting that could be going on behind the scenes. And that's really the biggest pain point that I hear in my capacity um, a lot of the times is that organizations will invest millions, if not tens of millions of dollars in these tools, expecting it to be kind of like their savior of giving that application view from the nitty gritty to the high level. But then the Z, which is a really critical part of their back end for an application, is not there. And it creates a whole other host of problems. So those are kind of the um, four main focuses that I like to start with anytime I'm talking about this subject um, with folks, because of course, it really is what drives us at IBM as a business um, to try and solve those problems for our customers. Um, and overall, just not at IBM, across the industry, this principle of observability has really driven a lot of innovation. And I like this graphic um, because I think it kind of brings together things a lot more clearly. Um, so the principle of observability, very straightforward, um, being able to see everything that's going on in your application. But of course, it's not just limited to any one type of data collection. There are metrics, of course, that help us determine system health. So in my mind, I'm thinking very Z focused, like CPU consumption. Um, or memory consumption. We've got, of course, our logs, um, which is, I like to call the information we look at only when things are bad. Um, and then traces, which are end-to-end -end flows of an execution path. So I'll talk a lot about like the customer journey or um, the hops across a customer's experience. And that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, when I go on to my mobile payment application and I execute a transaction with one of my friends or family members, the journey of the front end being pinged, the back end being pinged and the request to the other account, the withdrawal of uh, money from my account, all of those different hops you need to be able to see into because if something breaks down the line, uh, the team that has to go and fix that problem needs to know, of course, instantly exactly where the problem is. Um, and whatever identifying information they can get at the start of it to go and troubleshoot fairly quickly. So these are truly the, the three kind of main principles that make up observability. And I don't often give the context, but for folks that aren't aware, this is kind of a, a principle or a theory that was very much developed by some of the leading tech companies um, like Twitter, Facebook, Google, a lot of them in-house as they were scaling up these huge digital services. Um, they needed a way to truly monitor the experience before a lot of the technologies that we have available to us today were in the market. And that's where this whole kind of, um, I guess, theory of observability came from. And now it's, of course, being um, implemented and adopted in a bunch of different ways. So I think this is a really good way to think of it as well from a dev perspective. It's not just it's not just testing because, of course, from the developer side of things, you need to do everything you can to write all your test cases, ensure that you've got every scenario accounted for before you push to production. But it's also not just monitoring because we know that there are going to be circumstances that we don't know to look for. Um, I've met countless people who say, 
yeah, we had this problem where there was a significant customer outage, but everything on my dashboard looked fine. So I knew it wasn't my problem when at the end of the day, it could have truly been their problem because they were only looking at the metrics they expected to monitor um, for those predictable failures. And so observability tries to combine the best of both worlds by identifying, you know, the middle ground between what have you not tested for and what are you not monitoring for, including both sides of that as well, um, when you have the right tool and you can have the all possible permutations of, you know, what could go wrong. Um, so when you think about kind of bringing both sides of dev and ops together, um, I think observability makes total sense of how you truly get something practical that can help you see into your organization from both sides of the house. So we talked about traces, metrics, and logs. And really in the market today, you're seeing two kind of distinct categories of vendors that, that serve these up. Um, so you've got your APMs, like I kind of started to talk about application performance monitors, AppDynamics, Dynatrace, um, some of the newer entrants like Datadog and New Relic. Those are very much the ones you're going to go to to provide those spans or traces. Um, kind of like we referred to. And at the same time, as EPMs were growing popular, log analytic solutions were doing the same. So your Splunks, your Elastics, Sumo Logic, all of these vendors are very focused on surfacing you all those logs you could want um, and able to troubleshoot when something's gone wrong. And in between both of them, they both surface metrics, to be honest. Um, I know in ATM vendors, a variety of them have different metric surface capabilities and same with the log analytics side as well. Um, so very naturally in the marketplace, these two kind of central tenants of logs and, and traces have kind of evolved to be really popular on their own. Um, but of course, now we're seeing they are merging together. So all of the APMs are buying log analytics vendors and all the log analytics vendors are buying APMs um, with Splunk acquiring SignalFX, a pretty significant APM, um, Elastic, one of the other big log analytics vendors we're seeing Z customers using, making an APM acquisition. But of course, on the opposite side of that, um, uh, New Relic purchasing a startup and same with Datadog as well. So you can kind of see um, very in line with this observability kind of three-pronged approach that we talked about, everything is merging together into one big pot of competitors. And um, people will throw around the buzzword AI ops quite a lot. And I think that you could largely categorize all of these vendors in a bucket with AI ops in the pursuit or for true observability. Um, because now with all of these acquisitions, these mergers taking place, the goal is really to, to uphold all three tenants of that principle that we talked about. And that's very much coming, coming to fruition with these different vendors here. So I wanna spend some time talking about one of the main specific areas um, of observability, which is APMs or reading traces. And, and that's because in, when you think about the three tenants that you have um, under that Parthenon looking diagram, I don't wanna say one is more important than another um, because they're not, but as we kind of have already reviewed, all of the market is starting to collapse in on itself. And these vendors are starting to incorporate um, the other tenants of the house. So um, in cases like APMs, we, we mentioned a lot of them already surface different metrics that are going to help you get a few of the system health. Um, but also APMs are starting to incorporate um, support for logs as well. So I, in my capacity, am very focused on APMs and how you can get Z visibility in those APMs. So let's start there when we're talking about your observability journey and how we get Z a part of that. So for people who are super unfamiliar, um, which is not uncommon, um, when I do talk to Z folks inside of our customers, I normally start from square one on what an APM does or how it works. And like we said, the main goal here is in pursuit of surfacing traces. And how do we do that? First, we have to visualize all of the application infrastructure. Um, and the 
term, a single pane of glass gets thrown around a lot, but that's truly what we're, you know, trying to achieve here. And like I mentioned, the APM market has really understood that this needs to be done in a lightweight fashion. It has to be fast. It cannot slow things down. The overhead has to be low. So they have, in most cases, a set of agents that you can just slap onto your code and you're going to get this dynam dynamic topology view of what's going on inside your inside your application. And that's where the kind of exciting buzzwordy stuff starts to happen where baselining occurs where the APM starts to learn what's normal with your application. Um, so maybe every day on the 15th of the month when people get paid at lunchtime, um, a banking application sees a surge in traffic um, because everybody's checking to make sure their paycheck arrived um, as expected. Now, a baseline would also tell you that if you saw that surge of traffic at like 2 a.m. on a Saturday, you'd be a little concerned. So baselining helps to understand what's normal for your application um, at all times of day with different conditions. Of course, if you're I don't know, credit card processing company, a baselining approach is going to, you know, reflect that around Black Friday, um, you're going to see a lot more processing versus um, maybe mid January where everybody's trying to tighten up their budgets after excessive holiday spending. So um, the baselining is, is really probably the most exciting part to me because you get to start to really apply those AI ML capabilities and see, um, you know, after the computation of so much data, when things are starting to go wrong, even just a little bit on the margins. And then of course, once you know that something's turning towards abnormal, um, the diagnose happens where they start collecting all of the data around the event and you can see right away, okay, it looks like here's the problem. And kind of like I mentioned, a lot of these APM tools are geared towards, um, you know, a DevOps market as well. And they'll even surface, you know, code level visibility so they can do a lot of the heavy lifting if something's gone wrong to say here's the line of code where something got screwed up that needs to be fixed which i think is just really neat um and of course like i mentioned the the other side of the apm is the very high level view for some of the business folks uh which of course can help you prioritize when something has gone wrong uh, is fixing A first going to save us this much money versus fixing B, being able to assess the severity and how many customers are impacted, that all falls under the scope of these applications first monitoring tools. So when you look at the market for uh, APM tools, this is the most recent Gartner Magic Quadrant, you can see a lot of the vendors out there don't have any uh, Z support out of the box. There are a couple with some Z visibility. Um, some of them have like dependencies on other Z specific monitoring tools, but for the most part, the market does not give a lot of credence to uh, Z workloads. And of course, that's a problem when we think about the growth of the platform as well as um, how many business critical applications depend on the platform uh, to execute their core functions. And so I like to spend a little time talking about the different folks that can be involved because I've already started to mention how I work with different uh, individuals across organizations whenever I'm talking with customers. So we've got our line of business folks. Those are the ones that are looking for that red, yellow, and green dashboard. They just want to make sure that, you know, the, the business is running as expected. And reporting to them are those SREs, application owners. They're the ones that are regular users of an APM tool. Um, a lot of times they have like one kind of realm that they're responsible for, like this business application is their responsibility. Um, and they are maniacally focused on ensuring that that one application is working as expected. Um, and of course, you've got your Z folks, so system admins, the SM, SMEs, uh, the folks that really know the Z well and are responsible for ensuring the box is doing what it should. And I think the last bullet on each of those columns is important to call out here because the application owners, they really don't have much Z knowledge. Um, they may know that their Z workloads as a part of that application that they're responsible for, um, but they 
you may be in a totally different geo, a totally different part of the world than, than the Z team. Um, and of course, the Z guys, they have the tools they know and love, um, whether it's the Omegamons or the Sysviews, what have you. Um, they are not searching for some new application centric monitoring tool. Um, they prefer their infrastructure monitoring tools. Um, and in a lot of cases, what I see is the line of business and the application owner adopts an APM solution. And then it's on the Z people after the fact who didn't have any part in the vending of the solution to say, okay, how do we eliminate the black box that now exists for the Z um, in this tool? And it falls to the Z team to try and do that for the other parts of the organization that will be using the tool. And I think what has to be said from the start is that a, a successful application observability journey is not about making Mickey a Z expert or Jim, these are the names we have our, for our personas, um, not making Jim you know, an expert on the entire business application nor do we want people switching tools or trying to completely change their way of working. We just want to ensure that they can work better together. And I always show this screen because when I have a mixed audience, it's kind of shocking to folks who are, you know, more on the application side that green screens still exist. And for the Z teams to look at an APM dashboard and see all of the different things that uh, a Mickey or an SRE is worried about, they're, you know, typically very focused on their infrastructure views. So the goal here is to enable joint collaboration, not to try and, you know, take one person and get rid of their tool and get them all working together on a single tool that may not be right for their job function. So this is the experience that we see um, in a lot of our shops where a team has adopted an APM solution across a business application, but they still have that black box on Z. So Mickey could potentially get a performance deviation alert saying, you know, it looks like something is running slower than normal. Um, you should be aware that customers may be impacted soon. And it may look like it's coming from Z, but of course you can't get any detail on where the problem is. So this is a real life example that I've been told. Um, the SRE I was talking to said, well, the last time we had a problem with Z, it was MQ. So I went straight to the person that owns MQ on Z. And of course you create this very painful mini war room scenario where everybody's pointing fingers. It's not probably as grand as the war rooms that some customers have to pull together because you have adopted an APM and you were at least able to isolate the problem to Z. Um, but still she's jumping back and forth between MQ, IMS until finally she arrives at kicks and it seems to be the problem with them. But of course, like we talked about at the start of this presentation, this is all costing the business money. It's probably high stress because like we said, they're pointing fingers at each other um, and customers are being impacted. And at the end of the day, that's the, the really painful bit. And so this here is what App Dynamics looks like if we're, we're reviewing a screenshot. And if I was showing you kind of what it looked like before there was any Z visibility, you would just see one node one little black box node to show the transactions heading off into the mainframe. But this is the additional levels of visibility that can be possible um, when you in incorporate a, a solution or a tool that does have Z support for an APM. You can see that there's a call from a distributed web application coming into the mainframe, going from KixTG to Kix to backends like vSAM or DB2, um, as well as ZOS Connect requests going into IMS and down that path as well. So now she's not looking at a black box wondering like where is the problem on Z, she can get additional levels of visibility to start her troubleshooting without really having much Z knowledge herself. So this experience is a lot different. Um, right away, she can see that same performance deviation alert is occurring, but she's not just kind of keeping it at this high level view uh, of, oh, it must be on the mainframe. She can see it's with kicks and she even gets some, you know, additional kind of 
troubleshooting information of like where the problem is located. So when she goes to reach out to the person that's responsible for that part of the Z that is going to be the one critical for solving the problem, she can give them a head start on, okay, here is, you know, the region where the issue is located or the task ID or the name of the associated transaction that seems to be giving us some trouble. And I talk about this a lot of times, you know, very much like the IT ops team reaching out to the Z team, because in many cases, that's what I see in our customers. But really, this doesn't just have to go in that direction. Um, we have a, a growing interest of Z SMEs or Z folks that actually find this type of view, this, this fully integrated application view quite interesting uh, because the tools that are traditionally used like Megamon or SysView or ASG are super infrastructure focused. Um, they don't often get to see or they don't have a window into the distributed applications that are making calls uh, into the resources they're responsible for. So if the distributed team makes a change, sometimes that can be, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back and ultimately causes a problem downstream on the mainframe. And so providing this view, while it's not probably going to be the main thing that a Z team uses to be able to, um, you know, triage a problem and ultimately solve it, it does, um, kind of provide something interesting that some of the Z teams are warming up to that gives them an insight into, you know, teams across their organization that are making decisions and changes that are going to impact their resources. So that's kind of what I mean by being able to work better together is not making the, the IT ops team Z experts and getting your Z team to kind of warm up to that application focused view um, and tooling that probably doesn't provide them super granular detail about, you know, the Z environment, but gives them that whole high level picture uh, that's necessary for a, an observable application across your organization. So that's where kind of my personal bias comes in. Um, I am an offering manager, a product manager, whatever you want to call it for a, an offering called ZAPM Connect. And this is a tool that IBM has created to enable uh, Z data to flow into APMs. Quite straightforward. Um, and I think there's two really big motivating factors to why we've delivered something like this to the market um, that speaks to the importance of this observability principle that we're seeing all of our customers adopt, which is one, we have to be open. It's not just the product that I work with, but across all of IBM Z, IBM strategy is to meet our customers where they are. We have to develop solutions that don't make the main frame kind of the awkward cousin that no one wants to talk to. We have to be easy to integrate part of the most exciting, most popular market leading tools. Um, and we can't continue to be this siloed platform that we have been for so long. But at the same time, we also recognize that APM vendors, log vendors, anyone that you we kind of saw on that screen before um, that is, you know, really making up the market of observability, they don't have a ton of Z expertise on their teams, not to say they can never build that, but as IBM, the one that builds the operating system, the hardware, the middleware, all of it, um, we, we have a special expertise that we can bring to the table uh, to enable these integrations into APMs or log solutions, anything AI ops, uh, because of uh, the, the knowledge, the brain trust that we have inside of our organizations. So that's why, I mean, it's specific in my mind to ZAPM Connect because that's obviously what I work on regularly, but it's not just this product alone. It's all of our AI ops focused strategy is about integrating and market leading tools and making sure that we can be a, a, a first class citizen of uh, all of the stuff our customers are excited about, but also bringing to the table the expertise that we have as Z experts. So I'll talk a little bit about how it works, just so people understand. And, and here I'm talking about app dynamics. ZAPM Connect, the goal here is not just to integrate with one vendor, it's to integrate with all market leading APMs. What we found is that app dynamics is quite popular with our IBM Z customers. So that's why a lot of my examples talk about AppD and my architecture explanation of how this technology works is going to mention AppD. So on the left hand side, you've got your distributed workloads, um, an HTTP server, WebSphere server, 
And they're already being monitored with that lightweight agent that I've been talking about that App Dynamics provides. Um, and so how this agent works is basically it slaps a unique identifier, um, what they call their singularity header on every transaction that touches those servers. So kind of just like giving these things a unique barcode. And so on the mainframe, everything in pink uh, is what makes up ZAPM Connect. So we've got agents running in kicks, a container that runs in a started task, and then the small off-platform component. And with this started task, this container component, we start listening for any transaction coming into the mainframe that has that singularity header on it. And when we detect the presence of that, we start tracking uh, the transaction as it hits the mainframe and its journey as it continues through the platform. Um, and then once a transaction is kind of completed and we've collected its journey on the platform, we send that to that off-platform Linux box, what we call our distributed gateway, that stitches everything back together. It does all the heavy lifting off of ZOS and gets it back into the APM controller that AppDynamics has. So you get that full integrated view um, that we saw earlier. And I think there's two really important key things here. One, um, we're very specific to only track those transactions tagged with an AppD header because we know this observability journey inherently when you think about it applying to Z, it's going to be difficult because of course the platform is so highly efficient and you can't just go slapping on additional monitoring tools. And that's probably the number one objection that I hear when I talk to Z teams is, oh, we already have a monitor. We don't, we don't wanna add anything else, which is fair, I, I get that. But we've been very careful to try and minimize any overhead and make this as lightweight as a solution as possible because we know you have to do that um, if people are going to adopt your solution. So that's why um, we only track those transactions that are tagged with a header um, that's coming from an APM. We don't track absolutely everything that's happening on the platform because like we said, you already have a monitoring tool for that purpose. And of course, it if you've got transactions going off like batch jobs or what have you that aren't related to an end business user application, why are we monitoring it? The goal of APM is to tie everything back to an end user's experience. So we don't want to track anything superfluous above and beyond that. And similarly, um, I get questions all the time of like, why do I need a Linux box off the platform? And that's again, focused on overhead. We want to do all the heavy lifting off platform um, where, you know, CPU isn't as expensive before it all goes back to app dynamics. So that's how, you know, like when you get into the nitty gritty of this type of solution, that's how it all works. Um, and the next kind of question we get is, okay, you talked about CTG or Kicks or ZOS Connect, what have you. Um, we have a variety of different application configurations that we can support with the product today. Whether you are going through CTG, Kix is really the sweet spot, Kix transaction server that we hear a lot of our customers requesting. And we've got a variety of backends that are necessary um, for us to support like IMSDB, vSAM, DB2, all of these different kind of possible permutations all are supported with the product today. So you can get that full um, observability journey, even if you um, aren't using, you know, one of the flows that we've already talked about here. And the same can be true for IMS as well. Um, you've got calls like in Kix, calls between IMS regions can be supported uh, as well as various backends like DB2 and IMS TV, um, as well as some of the entrants that are definitely more modern, like coming in through ZOS Connect. So I think that's a really popular application that I hear a lot is customers are adopting new exciting Z technology like ZOS Connect. And a lot of it's being driven by um, requests from the rest of your uh, organization, not just the Z team, to be able to access Z data more easily. And that's really what ZOS Connect does so well. But you need to be able to kind of monitor that as you roll it out in production. And that's where we see a lot of folks turning to a Z integration into their APM tool, because you can get such deep, deep level visibility into the API calls being made with this type of integration. And so on the previous couple of slides, we talked about 
you know, we're not trying to replace an Omegamon or replace a CISVU, but we do want to surface enough identifying information that enables an um, application owner to say, hey, I think this is where the problem is, and then give that information to the Z team um, for troubleshooting purposes. And you can see right away, ZOS Connect, we've got a ton of different information, whether it's surfacing at last time, um, the service name, the, the method of the call, the payload length, a ton of different information that makes troubleshooting and problem isolation even easier. But of course, we've got the same for kicks and IMS as well. Um, I know a lot of our customers are really interested in being able to see the ab code when a transaction fails. Um, that's, of course, a very easy one when something's gone wrong to give you that kind of almost log like information of, okay, where is the problem or what was the problem? as well as stuff that we've already kind of talked about, like what's the transaction name? What was the elapsed time? Has it completely slowed to a halt or is it just running slower than normal? Those are all kind of the exciting things that you can do um, with this integration and being able to surface um, Z data and a tool that's very product focused. So I'm being mindful of my time because I wanted to save a few minutes at the end for questions, at least 10. Um, but just to recap today, um, when we started this out, we, we kind of started with that introduction to what observability is, but more importantly, why do we care? Um, and I don't think it's a stretch for us to all understand that digital experience is going to break make or break brand loyalty. Um, and if you can't truly map your full experience, um, you're going to have a really hard time being able to troubleshoot or even proactively avoid problems um, when you have this opportunity or you've invested so much money to be able to baseline and early detect problems before they actually occur and use or impact end users. And of course, um, it's not to knock the complexity, the challenge that a lot of our customers are facing. We know that there's a lot on your plates, especially as applications get more complex. And I'm just throwing another thing on the pile of trying to make your job a bit harder by creating applications and monitoring your applications in a truly observable way. Um, but truly, I, I think that it should and at least I've seen in some of the organizations that have adopted these tools that providing an application focused approach to monitoring or an application focused view um, of your environment and your resources makes it a lot easier to get ahead of these problems before they become five alarm fires um, and being able to more quickly empathize and understand where your customer may be experiencing pain in their journey and get it addressed right away. And of course, I don't need to probably remind anyone here on this call that Z is a critical role in all of these different applications. And so whatever you do, however you go about your observability journey, whether you're very focused on surfacing logs or you're focused on APM tool, You've, you need to make sure that Z is part of that. And um, I know at least at IBM, we've done a good job of ensuring we can provide that option no matter which path you're going. Um, but of course, if, if you don't have that Z data in there, you're only going to be as strong as your weakest length. And that's going to be Z when it's a missing part of the picture. So that's my, that's my diatribe on observability for today. And I think I've hit right at the mark where I've left 10 minutes for questions. I know Sophie already mentioned um, submitting session feedback. And of course there's um, conference charity this year that's all linked at the back of the charts that should be uploaded, I think um, in the portal already, but I'll stop there to see if there are any questions that, that folks wanna ask. If anyone has any questions, can you please pop them in the chat and we can ask them to Nicole? Not and, so far. And if not, um, you can always reach me if you have follow-up questions. Nicole.nemec at IBM.com is my contact info. Um, I'm always anxious to talk observability, not just in the APM space, though that's my favorite area of it. Um, talk observability and how Z can be a more observable platform. Uh, I think it's really important for the health of the business going forward. And I see a question. Yes, you have got one question now. So I'm not a mainframe programmer expert as such. I have a team of experts who currently are using, I don't know how you pronounce that one, X-A-M-I-N-E, to look at the performance related matters on mainframe. 
and they're able to tell us where something may be going wrong in IBS, in IMS, DB2 or in kick transactions. How is the APM Connect different from those capabilities? That is a good question. I have not heard of that tool, but I'm very interested to go do a Google after the fact. Um, so uh, does it collect, ah, ah, sorry, I was reading ahead to Wendy's note. Um, I, I've not heard of that tool. It sounds like it's a good approach if you're definitely someone new to the platform and you were already able to get up and running with a tool to get that type of data. Um, now, what I'm sussing out, and again, I can't say I'm familiar with it, so um, I don't want to assume, but what I'm getting the feeling is that it may be one of those tools that is very specific to the platform alone, um, where the goal of, you know, integrating into an APM allows for, you know, all of the pieces to be together in that single pane of glass. So um, if, if you've got, you know, calls coming in from distributed or via the cloud into, into Z, you can troubleshoot and get this really nice view of, okay, we spent five seconds on the front end server and we spent 10 seconds in the cloud. These are obviously exaggerations, but then we spent 30 seconds in that initial kicks hop um, where things started to slow down longer than normal. So I think the, what you're describing sounds similar to what the APM Connected does and in our integration into the different APMs. Um, but I'm starting to guess that the difference is that tool is kind of a bit more Z siloed, whereas the, the integration we have here is meant to put the Z data alongside everything else. Um, but I'm going to have to, I'll have to Google that one right after the session and, and read up on it. And yeah, the other comments, blame it on blah, blah, blah. That is probably the number one thing that I hear when I present. Um, or a meeting with customers is the pain point of the finger pointing and the going back and forth. And that's why um, I think observability can really, especially when Z is a part of that, eliminate a lot of that problem because I kind of mentioned a lot of our Z folks have initial um, kind of hesitancy in adopting or even like saying yes to a tool like um, App Dynamics because they say, oh, well, I've got a Megamon. I, I don't need App Dynamics. I don't want to look at another view. But what you don't get out of your traditional Z monitoring tools is that kind of single pane of glass that everybody can look at and agree, okay, this is truly what is occurring. And when you can see that like Kix has gone red, there is really no ability to finger point anymore because everybody is looking at one single dashboard to say, yep, we all agree this is potentially where the problem is. So it does definitely eliminate that big problem that I know everybody seems to face. Any other questions? Thank you. Any others? I personally found it really interesting seeing all of the stats for how much of an impact customers' experience does have on who they choose to do their business with and things like that. So obviously we all know that it does have a massive impact because we experience it firsthand, but it's quite interesting to see actual statistics for it. Mm -hmm. I, I I'll have to take a look at that. Um, yeah, definitely. You have to, I mean, when you put on your consumer hat, it's obvious. Hmm. My personal example, oh my gosh, I could not tell more people about how much I hate my internet provider right now. But um, when you're thinking about it from a business perspective, you're like, oh, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, customers will be customers. But yeah, when you look at the data, it's true. We talk and we have so many different options for all of our different services. We're going to switch around if we have a bad experience, um, which I think is good for customers, but it's definitely stressful for businesses that are competing um, for our business. Yeah, I think as well now that it's so much easier to change providers and things now than it used to be. It used yep. to be, oh, it's not worth the effort for them to change, even if they have a short, bad experience. But now you're out of there. Yeah. Right. OK, so I don't think we have any more questions that I can see. Um, so I think we'll end the call there. So thank you everyone for joining. Please do give feedback to Nicole. So it's session 5AB um, and the QR codes there, if that's easier as well. Uh, so thank you very much and thank you for joining us Nicole and you can probably go back to bed now <laughs> um, 
and the next session will be at 12 o'clock. So thank you and goodbye, everybody. Thank you.